Our exhortation this morning is entitled, Come and See. And I uh, have a short reading here from Exodus chapter 3 before we have that. So if you want to look up Exodus chapter 3. You might recall it as a story of Moses. Exodus chapter 3, 1 through 6. Now Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses! And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. So with that, we'll look forward to an exhortation called Come and See. Well, good morning, everyone. And happy Mother's Day. It is a, it's a good thing to celebrate mothers, I think. Yeah. I, um, one time I gave a talk about mothers on Mother's Day, but not today. So that's all I'm going to do to acknowledge mothers today. And I do appreciate uh, my mother and all the things mothers do. But um, today we're going to talk Keep about... That, from mothers. that is correct. <laughs> uh, something else. Uh, first we're going to talk about... Um, my dresser, my whatever it is, armoire or something. Uh, we got that when I was, I don't know, when Sue and I first moved into our house, we picked up some used bedroom furniture. Uh, and in my particular one, it's high, I don't know, it's over my head. Uh, but in the top part, I throw a lot of junk in there. Um, and I have very few clothes in there. In that part, uh, I just put a lot of little things in there. So every once in a while, I clean it out. Uh, but most times when I clean it out, I keep all the stuff that I, I had in there because I look at it and think, eh, I, I think I want to keep this. Is it a junk drawer? Uh, sort of, but I wouldn't call it all junk. Um, so I just did that recently, and lo and behold, I brought some of it here today. So in this box is some of the stuff. That I keep in my armor. This is the stuff I kept. Um, now, most of you would not have a chance to see this stuff, right? Because it's in my bedroom. It's in my dresser. I don't think you would go in there normally and have a look around. Maybe some people would snoop around in there. I don't know. But, but uh, most people would not, I think. So I'm going to give one lucky person, and you know what, Laura? It's going to be you. I said I wasn't going to ask anybody uh, anything of you today, but I am. <clears throat> I'm going to have you come up and look in this box, okay? <laughs> but do not tell. Well, let's kind of turn it this way so people can't see. So only you can see what's in there. Kind of look through. Don't pull anything out. And just look through. And after you look through... <laughs> You can open anything up that's in there. She has a ring of 
familiarity. <laughs> <laughs> just, uh, <laughs> you didn't give me those things. So what do you want me to do? Just look at them, see off the things that are in there, kind of yeah. push things aside if you have to. And, uh, and you can... Uh, is there going to be a test or anything? Do I have to memorize No. It? What I want you to do is pick out one thing that you want to ask me a question about, like why it's in there. Okay. That was easy. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Why don't you just sit there for a second? That's a good one. I was hoping you'd pick that one. Can you see what this is? This is Gonzo from the Muppets. And he's got like a super Gonzo. He's got a cape on and stuff. The reason I don't throw this away is because Mitch gave this to me when he was really young. Oh. <laughs> You know, and I used to hang it from my uh, rear view mirror, so it was like St. Gonzo for a while. And people would always ask me, why is that hanging there? And I said, because Mitch gave it to me. And uh, like my other boys, they said, get rid of that, it's annoying. Because they would swing like this while we were driving. But it didn't annoy me, because I, you know, after a while I didn't even notice Gonzo there. But, um, so that's good. So looking through that box, well, you can look through some more. No, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> There's, like, do you think that you know more about me because of the things you saw in there? Um, there's a couple, yeah, a couple of things surprised me. Like what? Like, is that a knife? Is that like a... <coughs> yeah. Okay. So there's other things in here. There's my teeth. <laughs> so, those were popular for a while, a lot of fun. I didn't want to talk to you. Old. Yeah, I think you're talking about this. Yeah. And actually, I don't know if you've looked through more, but there's a lot of knives. Nice yeah, there. that's good. He's a knife person. How about disturbed. this one? Is that for big yeah. Here's a knife. There's something you'd like to tell us. You must have grown up in Rockford. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a knife. It's not the rock, right? So safe. I don't know. Here's a couple more knives. Are there <laughs> yeah, but you didn't open that oh, toy box. But in there, this is a recent addition. My dad gave me this. It's got his. Uh, draft notification and stuff in there. So, you know, I'm not going to throw that away, but uh, like whatever. So there's a, other stuff in here. There's, gone. So there's a baseball that was signed by some White Sox, but I can't even tell who they are because <laughs> I can't tell their. This was given to me by someone who was a Cubs fan. So. <laughs> So I didn't get the signature, so it doesn't mean that much to me. And I don't even know the players. And, oh, there's one more. Nice. A little yeah, one. It was a little disturbing. She was here. And another knife. A couple of nice pens. This one's really nice. It's a very expensive thing. <laughs> 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 so these are, this is a really nice pen. It's a, a water fur or something. That was a gift to me. There's a close range of I have some ski goggles. And the reason I got these for myself, but I knew if they were taken out of my drawer that they'd go into the general pile and my sons would soon lose them. So this is to keep me warm when it's really cold and windy out. I have a, a medal from when I was in the 
choir. And <laughs> <laughs> well, you could sing. Yeah, that's long gone. And you know what this is. Yeah. Everybody's probably got one of these. It's your graduation castle from guess which year? For high school. Seventy-three. Oh. Seventy-three. Yeah. Seventy-three. Yeah. yeah. Sad that we all know your age. And what do you do? This and then this, or the other way around. And a couple other things. Oh, this was a good one. This is a, a hockey card. And our neighbor used to be work for uh, one of those card companies. So this is a special one. It's that bell for from years ago. And if you hold it up to the light, that little round circle, you can see a bell for space in it. Pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows who had bell for us anymore. It is actually cool. So, you know, so I have all these things. The thing with the knives is I do like knives, but most of these were just given to me. Or this one, uh, which, switch you know, I, <laughs> it doesn't switch. If it switched, uh, I'd be really happy with it. But <laughs> it just pulls out. But this is, of course, what would you use this for except something nasty? <clears throat> but the other ones people have given me. Uh, yeah, actually, but you know what? I bought a bunch of tackle boxes, and this knife was in there. So I kept it. And a couple of the other knives were like that. Out of all those knives, this is the only one I ever bought. So the other ones were given to me or something. Anyway, that's a little glimpse into Stolen. Uh things I keep. Now, I think probably all of you have things like that. You maybe don't have your little space like I do in your dresser, but you have things that you keep, uh, things that are, have sentimental value, or they're just objects that have some value to you beyond their actual value. They're probably uh, not worth much to most people, <clears throat> But to you, they are worth something, just like Gonzo is to me, that little Gonzo. I just, you know, if, if that disappeared, I wouldn't be too upset, but when it comes to throwing it out, I wouldn't do it. Um, so by, by looking at those things, you get uh, maybe an idea of something more about me that you wouldn't have known. Uh, maybe you wonder why he keeps all those knives, and I don't have any idea why I keep them all, but I just don't want to throw them out. Um, but the point of this talk is that I think God does the same thing for us, that he shows us some things, and he asks you to come near and look at them, just like Laura did. Um, and sometimes we draw near and take a look at the things that he has presented us. And um, we can figure out more things about him. It's things that, you know, maybe other people either ignore or they were not asked to look at. Um, let's turn to uh, Exodus 24, because you might say, well, I don't think God has asked me to uh, draw near and look at some of those things. Maybe it's more like uh, what happened to these people in, in Exodus 24. You don't have to stay here, Laura. But, okay, good. I'm glad you're up here. <laughs> You can have a knife afterwards if you want. <laughs> uh, in verse 1, it says, <clears throat> uh, 
And he, which is God, said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship afar off. Moses alone shall come near to the Lord, but the others shall not come near, and the people shall not come up with him. So in this little event, it says, um, okay, Moses, I want you to bring uh, 70 elders along with uh, Aaron and his sons up a certain distance, and but you, only you, uh, can come the rest of the way. And he says, the rest of the people, no, they can't come at all. Um, so in verse 9, it says, Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel went up, and they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God and ate and drank. So I think that's pretty interesting. God is saying, uh, some of these men come up here, but to the rest of the people, he said, no, they can't come. And he said to Moses, only you can come the rest of the way up to uh, receive the tablets. So the majority of the people didn't get to see what these 70 uh, men plus Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu saw. They didn't get to see this pavement, uh, what looked like a pavement of sapphire stone. They didn't get to see God. Um, but there were 70 men plus Moses and Aaron. And then Moses got to go the rest of the way. So they saw a, a pretty good thing. Um, but you might think, well, I'm like the rest of the people that God never said, um, come and see, you know, come and see these important things. Uh, I'm like them and I don't really get to see God. But I think God did tell all of us to come near and we are like those 70 men. He has called us. Um, there's plenty of good things uh, that God has shown us. While we may not be Moses, we might not be like Abraham or David or Jesus, I believe we have been asked uh, to draw near and see some of these things. And once we have seen some things, then it's up to us to ask the questions, like Laura pulled Gonzo out and said, what's with this? And there was a story behind it, so you learn uh, more. And I, again, believe that's what God wants us to do, to keep coming closer. He'll show us things, and then we ask questions. Um, and some of the questions are, are it's hard because you know, we treasure things differently than other people. And, you know, God treasures things uh, way differently from us. I, I would think uh, God has no interest in, in uh, money or gold. So those kind of things he wouldn't treasure. Uh, but he certainly treasures us. And uh, he thinks highly of us, I think, especially if we draw near and ask questions of him. So let's look again at the reading from uh, Exodus chapter 3 when Moses was asked to come and see something. Um, so what happened in his life? We know that Moses uh, lived in Egypt for the first 40 years of his life. And if he thought he was going to save Israel because of his station uh, within Egypt, he was wrong. Um, in fact, he was a, uh, a fugitive from Egypt. He ran uh, to Midian and uh, was un unable to help Israel at all, the, the Hebrew people, because you know 
uh, he was not wanted in Egypt. He was a wanted man, but not for good reasons. But in Exodus chapter 3, um, the passage that Dan read this morning, we see that he is walking. Um, it's, it appears to be alone, and he sees this burning bush. And I think the, the interesting part here, and I think that this is something we have to pay attention to, is in um, verse 3, he says, I will turn aside and see the great sight, why the bush is not burnt. So he decides that there's something going on there, and uh, I think it's interesting that in verse 4 it says, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush. So. So we, you get the impression that Moses could have done something else. He could have said, I see this sight, but I'm not going to look at it. Uh, I'm not going to go investigate. Or he could have been so focused on something else that he wouldn't have seen it at all. But the fact is, as soon as God sees that he turns, to look, then he calls out to him. Um, so there's this um, idea of God seeing a, a movement towards him. Like I didn't, they're back here now. But you know, Laura came up to look at the items that I had in my box, and then. They get into a whole conversation, uh, which we didn't read about, but you know the story. Moses didn't really want to go back to Egypt. Um, he said, somebody else should be doing this because I, I am not able to do it. So that made me think, what does prevent people from turning aside to look at the things of God? And I think there's a few things, and maybe you can think of more. But I think it's fear, for one. Fear that if we do turn aside, we're going to see something um, that's too dif difficult for us to comprehend, or something is going to be asked of us that we don't think that we could do. And maybe that's what prevents us from turning aside and looking at the things of God at times. I think sometimes our sin prevents us because we know maybe something good is going on uh, over there, but we don't think we're worthy of participating in whatever it is, that our own sin uh, prevents us. And I think another thing is distractions to look elsewhere. So there might be a burning bush off to the side, but we're looking over at uh, something else, things of the world that uh, capture our gaze. <clears throat> yeah, and we don't want to. Uh, or we're so focused on unimportant things that we miss uh, the things of God. So all of those things can happen, but I think you know what happens with Moses is that he does turn aside, and even though what he's asked to do he thinks is too difficult for him, I think in the end, after he goes through um, 40 years in the wilderness, I don't think he would have traded that uh, for anything else. <clears throat> His connection with God just grew and grew. Uh, he became closer to God all of the time to the point where, you know, God says, you can come up to the top of the mountain. Uh, and I, I don't think the point is that, you know, Moses is so unique uh, 
that he's like the only one and we shouldn't even think about things like that. I think God is showing the progression of people and he's not saying you forget about it. It's only people that I picked. Uh, I think he's saying see what Moses path was to get up here. You can take the same path. In fact you can do it in stages like the uh, 70 elders <clears throat> and God will draw you closer and closer. Uh, but the people that run away, like the, the people did when uh, Moses first came on, or uh, God first came on Mount Sinai, they were so afraid that they said, you know, we, we can't hear anymore. So they ran away. I think we're not supposed to be like that. We're, uh, we're supposed to endure and and keep looking at the things that God has given us and we have already been given many things to see um, uh, let's look at Psalm 119 verse 97 This is David saying, Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Thy commandments, commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. So David takes a look at the law of God, and he says, This is wonderful. This is like, I can't believe I got to see this. Uh, many people looked at the law of God and said, This scares me. Um, I don't see much in here that's good for me. Uh, and maybe the Pharisees and people like that didn't really understand, but David sees it differently. He says, I, I got a glimpse into what God is like in the law. And he says, the more I think about it, the, the more I benefit from it. So, you know, he meditates on it. And, um, I think he asks questions about it. When he sees things he doesn't understand in the law, he asks questions. Uh, just like, why would Trent have so many knives in his box? You know, for me, I don't really know. But God knows why he has the things that he has, uh, why he thinks things are important. And so David is drawn in. He's drawn in by the law, but he has his own experiences after that. David says, why, why don't I build you a house? And God says, well, that's a good idea, but um, you're not going to. I have someone else in mind to build my house. Uh, but that was a very good idea. And David has more conversations with God. Uh, a lot of things happen in his life that are... The, I think they start uh, when you first look at things God has given you and say, this is marvelous, uh, you know, but there's things I don't understand, so you ask questions. So does it stop when you first look in the box? And, and remember, God does actually have a box in his innermost room. Uh, that at first he let nobody look at. It was the ark. Um, people knew what was in it, but uh, nobody was allowed to go in and look at those things. Um, but he tells us about them so that we can ask questions. And the book of Hebrews just talks all about them, how all those things are symbolic of other things. It's somebody that questioned what those things in the box were. What was in God's house? Uh, what made God put those things in his house? And, and what makes God happy? And then God draws you in through those things and he works in your life individually. I think it's the same for us. Um, 
So what is your burning bush? There's something you need to... It doesn't say that everybody expects a burning bush in their lives. There's going to be something different uh, for you. It may not be as miraculous, uh, but it may be. I don't know. We don't even know uh, what is to come in our lives. But I think the first step is to say, I think I'm going to look into this, uh, just like Moses did. And when you get whatever your burning bush is in your life, um, don't hesitate. I mean, turn aside and look at it. And you might think, well, that's very cloudy, like, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. What would be an example of um, turning aside for your own burning bush? And, you know, maybe you have examples in, in your life. I, I can't really say. Um, but I think it's happened in my life um, where special things have happened and it, it caused me to turn aside and maybe you have examples as well. So don't say, I'm not like these men, because you're exactly like them. Um, and, and that's the point of, of all these little uh, stories in the Bible. You are exactly uh, like these men. So when Jesus comes along, um, you know, he, I think he's dealing with the same thing. In um, John <clears throat> chapter 14, you know, Jesus starts chapter 14 out by saying, in my father's house are uh, many mansions or many rooms. So he's like getting ready to give them a tour of God's house, essentially. He's, he's telling them that, um, you know, he's, he's going to describe it. Uh, in, in verse 6, it says, Jesus said to him, this is Thomas, after he says, where are you going? He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. Henceforth you know him and have seen him. So Jesus says, I can show you all these things. That, uh, he's going to show us some very important things. And uh, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and we shall be satisfied. And this is discouraging to Jesus because he's been showing the Father his whole ministry. And now, he's um, before he's going to die, he's saying, um, I'm the only one that can truly show you uh, the Father. And, uh, he's pretty much saying, I, I can give you the tour of the innermost rooms. I can take you in there. And we know that he did, that the veil was ripped in half at Jesus' death. And he can show us the things of God. And Philip says, well, show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. And Jesus then says, uh, have I been with you so long and yet you do not know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So now we have another step in there, and you say, might think, well, how do we see Jesus then? Uh, how do we truly see him? Uh, we, he's not walking on the earth anymore. How can we go talk to him? Um, but we certainly can, and I think that's uh, encouragement for us not only um, to pray to God, but also uh, remember that we need to talk to his son as well uh, that, so that he can show us how to uh, approach the Father. Um, certainly we wouldn't want to 
talk to Jesus as we would talk to our Heavenly Father. But people did talk to him. Uh, the Apostle Paul spoke to him uh, after Jesus first spoke to, to Paul. But Jesus was a man. He knows what we're like, and he will help us. He's got the ability to help us know the Father better, to show us things, um, because he turned aside and submitted to his Father's will and saw all the great things. So, you know, it's okay for Philip to say, show us the Father, but Jesus' point is, I already have. And I think Jesus has already shown us the Father as well. Or he's taking us up, just like Moses uh, took the 70 elders up, and they saw marvelous things. So, I think there's many things given to us to help us understand God. And the greatest thing is his son, of course. He gave us his son. But just like I had all those things in a box, and maybe um, you can understand more about me uh, by the things that I saved and uh, the little stories behind them, um, you can tell more about God by the things that he has shown us. I, I believe he's showing us things all the time. And I also think that's why, you know, Dan was praying about uh, lost sheep again this morning. That's why it's such a tragedy uh, when people leave the faith or lose their faith for a little bit, not just because... Um, I mean, it's bad enough that uh, they have wandered away from their first love. But it's bad for us, too, because those people have their own unique burning bush. I think everybody does. And when you get everybody's different perspective, in this group of people that meet together, we're all uplifted. So if somebody drifts away, it's bad for all of us. Um, <clears throat> Is it kind of a box for us? Yeah, there's a box for each of us to look into. Uh, and I, I really believe that, that God has a special uh, uh, site for each of us. Uh, we do have general things that we can look into, and, and that's what hooks us in. That's what makes us say, like David, I love this. You know, I could meditate on this <clears throat> all the day, but then God draws us closer and gives us our own unique um, things to look into. At least I believe that. So now today we have another chance to draw near. It's another chance uh, to see the things of God. Uh, every Sunday most of us take the bread and wine um, and maybe we don't see enough when we take it. Uh, maybe sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. Uh, but let's try and draw near this day and think that we are special, that God really does have something in mind for us. And lest you think that that's, you're still doubtful that maybe God would treat you that specially, uh, I'm going to close by reading this from what Moses said. You know, Moses definitely uh, was pulled in to the things of God. He was able to see wonderful, marvelous things. And I think, you know, it maybe started back in Egypt, but I think the turning point for him was the burning bush. But he doesn't say, 
that's just me, I'm special. He says, that's for all of you. So in uh, Deuteronomy 29, verse 29, it says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. So the secret things, you know, he does say they belong to Bach, to God, just like that box of stuff belongs to me. Um, but the things that he has revealed he says, that belongs to all of us and to our children. So let's take care um, that we pay attention to those special secret things that God has revealed to us and then give glory to God uh, for the things that he has done for us. Thanks, Trent. Laura, you could have stayed up front. <laughs> she was kind of lonely, I could tell. <laughs> so let's continue with the uh, next hymn, which is number 230 in the Green Book. 230. Father, we seek thy blessing now, as round thy feast we rest. May we have thy presence here with us, who have Christ's name confessed. It's number 230. So Trent made me think about our memorials as he was talking about his box. So I thought, you know, every Sunday we come here and we have, you might say, our box. We have, we usually have this uh, thing on top. 
And sometimes I wonder why we have this on top, because Jesus took away the veil from us. So somehow we put a veil on top, but really no need to be. So we, we have our little box here, and then we have the same things every week. We have a little bit of bread. You might call it bread. You might not call it bread. It's unleavened bread. It's not the bread we're used to, but it's, it's unleavened bread. And then here we have these, these little cups of wine. And obviously it was different when Jesus uh, instituted this. He would have had one cup. I don't know how the bread looked exactly. Probably like more like pita bread that we see. But they had these little symbols, and these symbols make us think about things. We remember things, just like Trent's box. Each one had a little memory. So these memorials have a memory for us. In some ways, we think about the Old Testament. Bread and wine have a lot of memories. Uh, those were the basis of life. That's where people had their life from. If they didn't have bread or wine, often they wouldn't live. They were also used as an example of, of mourning for the dead. There's a, a passage in Jeremiah about mourning for the dead with bread and wine, breaking bread. And then for us, we think about Jesus, who instituted this, uh, this Last Supper when he took these two little things, these two things kind of like in a box, bread and wine, and instituted a great lesson for us so that now for us, they're the most important thing for us, just like maybe not... Trent's box isn't the most important thing for him, but they're meaningful. And so for us, the bread and wine are meaningful. So with that, let's uh, pause and uh, if I could ask Mike to say a prayer for the bread and then Mark, if you could follow with a, a, a prayer for the wine. Our God, we thank you so much for the images that you've given us, the to be able to look in into you, to be able to see closer. We thank you for the Bible and the, the different accounts that helps us to bring us closer to you. We thank you so much for your son, the gift of your son and everything that he means to us. And now we offer a prayer for this bread, which is symbolic of his body. And as we take it, we pray that we'll be strengthened to be more like him. We do pray for this through your son Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm. So, with our memories, we remember Jesus took bread, broke it, said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
Hicks Clause and Ray also regarding the wine. Heavenly Father, we come again before you this morning, thankful now for this cup, the wine that represents the blood of your son Jesus. We know this is a symbol of his sacrifice, that though he was not worthy of death, he did suffer death for our sake. And so, Father, as we reflect on ourselves, we see the areas in our lives that don't measure up to what we see in your Son. We know there are things that we need to confess to you, things that we need to work on, things we need your strength to help us to overcome so that we may be forgiven of these things. And Father, we thank you that your Son has done this, that he has given himself as a sacrifice for us, and so that we have a way to approach to you as we do now so that we have a hope of the kingdom that is to come, that all these things that we suffer in this present time will be done away with. And we look forward to that time, and we pray for it. And we thank you now for your son Jesus and his sacrifice. We pray your blessing will be upon this cup, to guide us closer and bring draw us no, nearer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we take a cup of wine. Remember Jesus said, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. You do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The exhortation again was entitled, Come and See. And if you're like me, my mind jumped right away to John chapter 1 when they were being introduced to Jesus and finding him. And the two disciples, they heard him speak and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and said, What do you seek? And they said, Rabbi, where are you staying? And he said, Come and, come and you will see. Come and see. 
So, same lesson for us today. We follow our Master, we remember Him, and we want to be like Him. Let's conclude with our last hymn, hymn 177. It's in the Praise the Lord book. 177. And then Steve, if I can ask you to say a closing prayer, that'd be great. In 177 in the praise book, How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only Son to make a wretch his treasure. It's number 177.